So good evening and welcome to the Java user group event of tonight um, with Heinz Kabut about dynamic proxies in Java. I'm still waiting a bit to make sure that everyone can transition from the waiting room over um, to the presentation. And I think we are done already. Great. It's me, it's Patrick from the Java user group, and I will do a short introduction and also mention a few organizational topics. Um, we have now an online format with Big Marker, and you probably attended already some of the talks online. And the talks will be actually recorded and published in a few days on YouTube. So just make sure um, that you can um, register on YouTube as well, like sign up for the Java user group um, site and get notified for future talks. We also have a Slack channel, so you can ask questions or you're getting informed there. So also sign up there and make sure um, you get in touch with others. It's usually also a nice place to meet afterwards, after the talk and just like mingle and talk to others and discuss about the topic as well. As you know, at the end of the talk, you will be automatically forwarded to um, the feedback form as we usually have it, right? And from um, the feedback forms, every month we will draw a winner of an IntelliJ IDEA license. Be aware of that there is a delay in the video stream. So while I'm talking, it takes about 15 seconds or a bit more until you can actually um, hear and see it. So that means also when you're writing in the chat, probably Heinz may already go a little bit forward with, with his talking. So we will have to deal with this um, thing. There is actually a chat and use the chat to ask questions or um, mention technical difficulties. So Marcus and I can take care about that. If you have questions in general, um, put them to the Q&A section because it's easier and we can mark them as well as answered. So it's easier to track for us. Heinz actually loves to answer the questions during the talk. So you don't have to wait until the end. And no, the polls we don't do tonight. We just found out before. Now, I'm really happy actually to have Heinz here because Heinz is the author of the well-known Java Specialist newsletter where he sends out a lot of um, funny puzzles and things like um, from the Java ecosystem. I met him a few years ago at the um, JCrete conference and then also afterwards, for example, at JAlba and other conferences. And I'm really happy to have him here to have a talk about um, Java and proxies because he did a book and he recently, I think it was like at the end of August, he released this book on InfoQ. So he is really knowledgeable in the topic. Right. Okay, great. So then I would say, welcome to Heinz and enjoy the talk. All right, I thought there was going to be a, a 30 minute intro. <laughs> I misunderstood you there. <laughs> All right, let me share my screen. <laughs> so there's no 30 minute intro. It's a, it sounds like a 30 second intro. Okay, fantastic. All right. So um, thanks so much for inviting me. Um, really appreciate it. I am. Um, I, I tweeted uh, a few months ago that I'm very happy to speak at any remote event at the moment. And uh, and so Patrick kindly said, hey, you know, we've got Jug CH. Wouldn't you like to speak here again? And I think I've, I've spoken with your group once or twice before. I've got this really cool pocket knife, this um, absolutely amazing Swiss pocket knife from which I got from, I think it's from, I think it's from you, from Jug CH. So um, good times, very good times. So um, yeah, um, so I'm I'm the presenter. I've got uh, um, my wonderful friend John Green in the background. He's he's monitoring the um, the conversation. So if there's any any questions, he will send them to me on a different channel so that I can actually um, 
so that, so I can answer them as we go through the through the talk. So I'm going to stand because it's easier talking when you're standing. Um, it's not just because you're then taller, which <laughs> I'm obviously taller than I would otherwise be, but um, it's easier to concentrate when you when you're standing. Um, as we all know, right? It's uh, uh, we want more creative, and it's easier. Also, speaking is easier when you're standing up. So standing is a bit easier. Um, now, with I want to talk a little bit about where these dynamic proxies come from, and they originally come from, um, well, the idea is the following: that sometimes we need to to create um, code in order to build ecosystems. And um, a long, long time ago, there was a, a system called RMIC, uh, um, which would create stubs and skeletons in order to uh, manage remote method calls with RMI. Now, I don't know if anybody still uses RMI. If you do, you can <laughs> post in the chat. Maybe don't, because <laughs> people go like, what? <laughs> you still using that? But it's an old technology, but um, even older is RMIC, where, well, it's, it's as old as RMI, but it's, it's, what it would do is it would generate stubs and skeletons in order to, to manage remote method calls. And the, the thing is that, that um, it was a bit of a pain because you would write your code and then you'd generate the stubs and skeletons from remote interfaces, which was really quite, quite, quite annoying. Um, and what they did in Java 1.3, which is already 20 years ago, is they gave us the option of, of generating all of these things dynamically with a thing called dynamic proxies. And the idea is that you, you basically write an invocation handler. This invocation handler is used for all of the methods on the proxy. And so we didn't, wouldn't really need to, to uh, use RMIC or similar build tools in order to build our system. We would just define an interface and an invocation handler would then run um, at whenever any method is called. So this gives you abilities to write flexible dynamic systems. And it can give us great wins. So one example we had was um, quite amazing because there was lots and lots of generated code. You know, I did an analysis of the system. It was 600,000 code statements, which is, it's not 600,000 lines of code. It was probably about... 100,000 lines of code, generated code. So it was a really big chunk of code. And this was all generated code from another language. So they'd taken another language that converted it to Java. And that particular part was very repetitive. And so what we were able to do is to replace the entire 600,000 code statements with a single dynamic proxy. So uh, that, that was a really big win. And all we needed to do is write one invocation handler and reuse it for hundreds or thousands of classes. Um, and so it's really useful to be able to, to not have to repeat yourself, to sort of write the code once and then reuse it over and over again. So that's one of the many benefits of the dynamic coding. And it's used in lots of different infrastructure code and frameworks. You'll see it in Spring. Annotations are implemented as dynamic proxies. Uh, that's why annotations are actually interfaces. Um, and they're implemented as dynamic proxies when you use them in, in, at runtime. Um, dependency injection, Hibernate, Gradle, a lot of these, or all of these, use dynamic proxies. And if you want to know which of your systems use it, well, I'll show you a trick that you can use to figure that out. Now, Patrick mentioned that I've got um, a book I've written. I've actually written two books on dynamic proxies. The first was a, a book in German with a friend of mine. And uh, it's quite good, but um, it was a long time ago. And I've, I've done lots of revisions of that topic. Um, and you can get it from here. And there's a new version coming out soon. <laughs> I got a, a foreword by, by Brian Goetz. Um, and that's going to be the second edition, but you know you can get this in the meantime. Now, before I show you how to use these dynamic proxies, I want to show you how we can use how we can write handcrafted proxies. In other words, how we can write them by hand. And the reason is, before you automate something, it is useful to see how you would go about doing it by hand first, so that you you've got some idea of of the process involved, and then we automate later. So, of course, you could use the IDE for generating all your code. And um, I'll, I'll do that in the beginning, but 
in the next section, I'll show you how to use a dynamic proxy to do it instead, because using it, generating code with the IDE uh, is also kind of pedestrian. Um, and what I mean by that is we might generate the code, we might have all this code generated, but then after we have to maintain it by hand. And, and quite often the generated code isn't exactly what we really wanted. My example here is that of the virtual proxy. And the virtual proxy, the idea with that is that if we've got an expensive object, we, we don't want to necessarily create it immediately because we might never need it. It's a bit like um, my annual tax return, which I don't, I know I have to do it at some point, but I always delay it for the last possible moment because there's all this paperwork and things to do. And I basically give it to my accountant. And when he says, okay, Heinz, we're going to do it now, then we do it. So it's, it's a virtual proxy. And, uh, uh, you know, Maybe the world, world will end before <laughs> I have to do the tax return, which will save me all the work of having to do the tax return. That's always my hope every year, Bob. I'm not hoping that the world will end, but I'm hoping that something will happen that I don't have to do it. But it never happens. I always have to do it. They say the two most uh, reliable things are death and taxes, unfortunately. But it's the example. You know, you've got this thing that I have to do. I don't really want to do it. So I delay it until later. And that's the idea of a virtual proxy. We've got this placeholder object, and we only create the costly object when we when we use it for the first time. So in the meantime, there's this just proxy, this Stellvertreter, um, uh, substitute object. And um, so the example I've got is of something that's very similar to a normal map. The, I call it custom map because it's a slightly reduced version of the normal map. Um, I, I, instead of having like 50 methods, I only have six methods. Um, size, get, put, remove, clear, and for each. And this custom map, um, if I want to uh, have an implementation of that, I can delegate all of the method calls through to the through to normal hash map. So for example, here, um, I've made my custom hash map. This is my own little hash map. And inside, I've got my private final map, map equals new hash map. And um, in the constructor, I print out that I'm constructing it just so we know when it gets constructed. And then all of the methods are delegated through to the hash map, right? Size, get, put, remove, clear for each, and two string. All? Well, not all. You see, I've, I've forgotten a few. And uh, it's easy to forget a few if you're not being very careful. Um, so that's the custom hash map. And it's basically just all delegating through to the actual hash map implementation. Um, now, what the virtual proxy would look like, um, I would have inside the virtual custom map, this is now a virtual proxy, a pointer to a real map. But that will start off as null. So it starts off as null, and um, also have a supplier of custom map. So the supplier of custom map is is used to to create the map when we use it for the first time. And uh, there's a method at the bottom here called get real map that gets the actual map, and it's a private method that gets called by the other methods. You'll see that in a moment. And here I'm constructing the real map on demand. So the first time that I call it, real map will be null, and I'm going to call map supply.get and I make this new map, and then I assign it into the field. And here I've got your, your, all the methods all delegate through to the get real map method. So just lots of delegation going on. Each of the methods simply calls get real map. And when I, when I call any method on this virtual proxy, it's then going to call get real map, and that is going to then uh, create the actual map by calling the supplier. Right, so nice and nice and easy. And um, so the virtual custom map um, is made when when any method is called. It doesn't matter which one you call, whatever you call is going to be constructed. So if you look here, I'm constructing a virtual custom map with a, a, a method reference that will construct a custom hash map. And so I print out virtual map created. And the moment I, I use the map in some way, for example, I put or clear or set or get, whatever, then it's going to say, 
custom hash map constructed. So it gets constructed when it's used for the very first time. All right. Um, so that's how you do it by hand. Now, dynamic proxies have the benefit that you write the code once, you can use it for any sort of uh, virtual proxy you might want. It could be for, um, for hash map, it could be for Heinz's tax return, it could be for um, anything where you want to have something later created. You want to make a data source on demand, this is your friend, this will do it for you. Well, one of the problems that we have, a problem we face all the time in software development is this copy and paste programming. So you have a you have a bug and the bug uh, appears somewhere and then you copy and paste the code and now the bug is somewhere else. So and the bug sort of moves throughout the whole code base. Um, we actually had this with this presentation. Uh, John and I, uh, my lovely assistant, uh, we we had we as part of my dynamic proxies book, I also wrote the dynamic proxies course. And um, and so I had one mis one mistake on a slide, and then I copied that I copied that that course to make a presentation, and I copied and pasted that mistake along with that presentation, and I eventually found I had about ten different places where that same bug had been copied and pasted. That's always a problem with presentations, and of course in source code that's the problem because you fix one bug, but then it appears again in other places. We all know what this is, and it's a real pain. It's horrible. So a better approach is to either statically or dynamically generate the code. It's a much better approach. So here's how you do it. There's a class called proxy. It's been around since uh, for 20 years. And you say proxy.new proxy instance. And we pass in three parameters. First of all, a class loader, where the new proxy class is loaded. And then a class array that contains all interfaces our proxy must implement. Could be more than one because we can, of course, implement lots and lots of interfaces at the same time. And then we also pass in a functional interface, an uh, invocation handler. And this is called when any proxy method is invoked. So you call the method, it goes through this one place. So it all goes to one place. And uh, invocation handler, this is the functional interface with a single method called invoke. This is called when any method is called on the proxy. Uh, the inv it contains a method called invoke, which has three parameters. The first parameter is the dynamic proxy class that is calling invoke. So it's the actual instance of your dynamic proxy. The second is the method, the class, the, the, the method that's being invoked. And I'll show you how we get that. And then the third is an array containing all the parameters. Right. And the array might be null. So if it's a method that doesn't have any parameters, the array is null. So it's not going to be an empty array, it's just a null array. Oh, something else which is interesting is the method is going to be one of the interface methods or equals hash code or string, one of those three. So and because those are those are public non-final methods on objects. So it's the interface methods or one of those three. And if you remember when we did the, cust the, the virtual proxy uh, by hand, we forgot to implement those three. So if you said two string, you would see this virtual custom map. You go, what's that? What's this virtual custom map? You, you'd, you'd see the default two string method. You wouldn't see the actual method you would expect to be, to be calling. All right, so um, I want to show you an example of a logging invocation handler. And uh, the way that it works is we want to log every time we go into method, entering and we leave exiting and also optionally measure the time, how long it takes. So the way that it, oh, hold on, um, forgot about this. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, so Patrick already in introduced me very nicely and I certainly can't do anything nearly as nice as Patrick did, but I've got a present for you. Right. Last time I went to Switzerland, I got this amazing pocket knife and I've got something back for you, which is, if you look at the top there, tinyurl.com slash jugch911, I <laughs> thought a nice, nice car, uh, I thought I'd put that in there, then you'll get a little gift. Now, that gift expires um, about an hour and 10 minutes from now. So if you're watching the live stream, you, you, you made the effort on a Friday night to come and watch the live stream, you're getting it. 
But if you're watching the recording, well, you're not going to get it. So unfortunately, that's how life is. Next time, go to the live event and you can get whatever gifts they're giving away. And uh, yeah, I've, I've been doing this remote teaching for a very long time. Uh, last week, we spent a whole week, actually, John and I, teaching um, design patterns and refactoring together with s and S Media, which is really a lot of fun. Um, so if you'd like to know more about my online courses, send me an email. I'm happy to hear from you. And don't forget to get that, uh, that gift. Uh, gift as in a present, not gift as in the, the, the German gift. <laughs> and I had a Swiss friend in South Africa who made that mistake. He sent a, a packet of, of some food from South Africa to Switzerland. And um, as the description he wrote on the gift, and it was dried meat from South Africa. They, they eat that. It's a bit like beef, beef jerky, but just a bit more unrefined. And uh, <laughs> his parents got this parcel from their son in, in South Africa, and it said on their description, gift, uh, was, was schickt der Junge uns denn jetzt? And they looked at it, and they opened it up, and they couldn't figure out what that stuff would, would be. They tried to boil it. They tried to plant it. And they couldn't figure it out with the name gift. So it's not that type of gift. It's, it's a present, right? So enjoy it. All right. Let's go back to our logging vacation handler. And we want to log all the method calls and optionally measure how long they take. So when you pass construct, we'll have the, the, the logger and the object that we need to delegate the calls to. Now, it's very important that the object that we pass in implements the interface or interfaces that we, that we want to, um, or that we're proxying. Otherwise, you're going to get an, get an exception. Um, and uh, this is what the invoke method looks like. That's the most important part here. Um, again, three, three parameters, proxy method and args. And there are two things I haven't mentioned before, but I'll just mention them now quickly. Um, invoke returns objects. So it can return anything from that method. But you'd have to be careful because what you return has to be compatible with the actual method. Otherwise, you'll get exceptions. Uh, it also throws throwable. And again, you could throw anything. You could throw a checked exception. But again, you have to be careful that what you throw um, actually is compatible with the method signature. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem. And I'll explain why that happens in a moment. So here I'm just printing something, logging, entering, and logging, exiting. And, and I've got an opt a nice little optimization here um, where I, I figure out what the log level of is. If log find is true, um, then I measure system nanotime because that's uh, not, not a very quick call. Um, otherwise, I don't, I don't do that. So um, I only measure the time if I've got log fine enabled. All right, and then the two string... I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This basically just prints out the class name, the method name, and the parameters, if, it, if there are parameters. So here I've got my, my, uh, my map. And um, if you look carefully at this, I'm saying proxy.new proxy instance. I'm passing in the class load of map. So what is that? The class load of map. What is that? The class load of map is your bootstrap class loader. That's the, that's the class loader that's loading all your... JD, JVM, JDK classes. <clears throat> so the the system, the, the class that belong to your to a virtual machine are loaded with your bootstrap class loader. The classes that are loaded with that's loading the so class loader which is loading our own classes is the system class loader or um, application class loader. There are different names for it. Um, <clears throat> And it's important that the class loader can obviously see our interface. If it can't, then it won't be, it won't work. So the way I normally do it is I use the, the same class loader as that of the interface. So that's why I'm saying map.class.get class loader. And then I pass in a class array containing only the map.class. And because it's a class array, I could have several um, interfaces here, but I'm just going to have one. And then I've got my logging invocation handler, which is my um, the one I showed you a moment ago, with a concurrent hash map. So, of course, that implements map. So if I call any method on map, it's going to delegate that through to the concurrent hash map, but measure before and after to see how long it took. And there's my output for the first method, for put, before and after, and also the time. All right. 
Now, I find it useful to look at how things work, to sort of open it up and peek inside and what's actually going on here. And uh, we're going to start with a, a simple interface called ISO date parser, which takes a string and returns a local date, throwing a parse exception. So this interface um, is very simple, just one method. And if I if I if I load that with the with the if I create a dynamic proxy with that, and I say proxy at new proxy instance with the class loader of the ISO date parser, which now is the system class loader, and the class array, which contains ISO date parser. Oh, see, there's a question. Ah, yeah, good question about from Christian. Thanks. Um, dim, 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 dim. Okay. So is this the same get class loader for Java modules, Java 9 plus with modules? <laughs> so when when I wrote the book, the the the, the latest one that's now you know available, um, I was writing it and I thought, you know, it is 2019 when I started the book. And uh, I probably should just double check that everything that I expect to be working also works with modules. So <laughs> the Java modules. And and <laughs> so I started digging into that. And the more I dug into it, the more issues I found with <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say with, with the modules themselves, but rather with my code to work with the modules. It gets really interesting. Um, uh, and I'll mention this again a little bit in a little bit when we talk about um, the naming of, of, of these proxies. Because here, when I was saying get class loader um, and, and, I'm, and I'm constructing this new class, because the dynamic proxy is actually a new class, given that interface, it's going to insert it into that class loader, right? So here I'm going to write it into the system class loader, and the previous one I put into the Bootstrap class loader. So this it kind of seems it seems dangerous to be able to inject a class into somebody else's class loader. However, the dynamic proxy class itself doesn't actually do anything. All it does is it delegates all the methods through to the invocation handler. And that is not inside the inside whichever you know class loader you've injected it to. That's going to be in, in your own class loader. So um, and the modules basically are going to be a similar type of situation. Um, if, for example, I have an interface um, that's inside my module, but it's inside a package which is not exported, you, you're actually going to have a, have a different. Um, name a different package and different module where it gets constructed than 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 otherwise, and uh, I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. It's a really good question, and um, <laughs> so so, off, so with this with these modules, um, I then tried to get it working with um, IntelliJ, IntelliJ modules, and Maven modules, and JPMS modules all working together, and um, luckily I've got my my friend John. Uh, Green, who who helped a lot in getting my sort so of getting stuff like that figured out, um, but that wasn't enough. It was two of us, and then then we got Simone Bourdais. I think it was Simone Bourdais. Oh, no, it wasn't it? Wasn't him? Yeah, I think Simone Bourdais and Robert uh, Schalter um, also helped us to get this all working. Like the, like the tech lead for for Maven and. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I think I might have even asked somebody from IntelliJ as well because it was really, really hard for some reason. I don't, I'm not quite sure why it was so difficult to get this all working. And um, and the samples are all available um, on on my GitHub repository and um, and and on Maven Central as well. Now for the next version of the book, which is ready, um, uh, John has sent me the. The link, uh, the PDF. I just haven't had a chance to look at it yet, to to proof it. But it is ready for publishing, uh, the, the the next version. Um, but in the next version, we've we've split up our, our packages and our modules a bit better, so that uh, you don't get unnecessary dependencies. Um, so it's 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 a bit better. Um, but yeah, the the module system is a very interesting <laughs> piece of machinery, which um, I think in the end, I, I'm very happy that we have it. 
but it took a, a crazy amount of effort to make everything work. All right. Ah, yeah. So that's the like typically you're going to find a name like this: com sun proxy dollar proxy zero. All right. Now, um, when you look at that, you say, what is actually inside that dollar proxy zero? Um, and there's a way you can find out by dumping the generated proxy classes to your disk. So this is Java, um, for example, Java 9 plus, you just say minus D JDK proxy, proxy generated or save generated files equals true. And then when you run it on your disk, you see all these different files. And, and so if you've got a system that you're using and you want to know, do they use dynamic proxies? You can actually do that. You can generate all the proxy files and you'll see what uh, classes are generated. But the, the classes do get reused. So if you've got multiple uh, places using the same dynamic proxy of the same interfaces, they'll all uh, be there, um, or they'll all share one, one actual generated class. So you won't know how many instances of dynamic proxies you'll have, but you will know how many um, like combinations of interfaces are supported by or are implemented as dynamic proxies in your system. So that's uh, that's very useful. And then when you've got the generated classes, then you can decompile them with a tool like CFR. Now, of course, you need to make sure that wherever you are working, that you're actually allowed to decompile classes. <laughs> Be really a, a bit absurd if you if you weren't allowed to decompile classes that you compiled yourself, right? But um, uh, I, I think one does have to be careful with things like that. Um, so there you go. CFR is a very, very nice tool for that. And here's what you'll find. Something like this. You'll see a class with a funny name like $proxy0, which extends proxy and implements ISO date parser. And um, so it's a final class, which means we can't subclass it further. And we've got four methods inside, m0, m1, m2, m3. And um, <clears throat> when we load the class, static initializer block, we set up all the methods, m0, m1, m2, m3. m0 is the hash code method. m1 is the equals method. m2 is the two-string method. And m3 is the parse method from isolate parser. Now, um, I've simplified the code a little bit. In the actual code, they use class.4 name for each of the classes as well, um, but I'm just using object.class rather than class.4 name Java Lang object. It's a bit shorter, but if you look at the actual code, the actual generated code, um, it's a bit more verbose. In the end, we've loaded all the methods, and this is normal Java Lang reflection, nothing really special about that. And then um, the constructor of $proxy0 takes an invocation handler and simply passes that to the superclass. So there we go. And, and then we've got different methods like hash code and equals. And um, hash code, um, what it does is I call h.invoke. So I'm calling the handler.invoke. This, the current dynamic proxy, comma m0, that's that method that we found earlier, and null for an object array. And um, then we return, we take the hash code, we return it um, as an int. Now, here's already a problem because if my hash code function is a little bit complex, um, it can happen that the integer object exceeds the size of my cached int uh, integers. And so it might happen that I actually end up with making a new integer object every time I call hash code. So it can happen that you have object creation because of the return type. It all depends how it's being used. Sometimes it can be optimized away, but not always. And um, all right, equals is a, is a little bit different because here I've got a parameter that I'm passing into the method. So the parameter is wrapped as an object array or inside an object array. And um, so then again, the second thing is sometimes it happens that the object array has to be actually allocated um, sometimes it can be optimized away. It depends on how it's used inside your method. So that's something which one has to consider. Um, okay, so Oliver Zett asks, I guess that's done with reflection. Um, the, does that also mean I have to export my classes when using Java 9 modules to be able to, to, be able to use proxies? 
Um, no, it doesn't. Um, if you want to use proxies within your module for your interface, which is not exported, that's completely fine. Um, you can do that. What it will do is it will actually generate um, a dynamic module. I think that's what it's called. I'm not sure. Maybe Johnny can just double check that for me if you can. Um, I think it's called a dynamic module or an unnamed module maybe. But uh, what happens is it generates a module and loads that class in that module. So we can see that, but no one else can see it. So it managed all that for us, and but nobody else from outside could use our interface to make a dynamic proxy. Uh, so it does work, and it is managed quite nicely, but um, it's not something we have to to worry about too much. Uh, but it, there is one there is one thing which can happen. Um, so one of the Java champions had a had a case where um, some code was using reflection to discover or to try to discover the method instances inside this dynamic proxy. And then what it was doing is it was trying to make these methods to be set accessible true. You might wonder why. I'll explain why in a moment. But that's what the code was trying to do. But the problem was that the, the, the interface was living inside an unexported module, a package, unexported package inside a module. And so, um, the um, and and so and so the code that was trying to do the method um, set accessible true uh, simply got an exception, and of course um, it wasn't it it was quite quite hard to get the workaround to be able to to then you know override that 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 exception that that security exception or illegal access exception or something like that. They managed to do it with I think Byte Buddy eventually, but it was it was quite uh, quite tough. The reason I don't immediately respond to your questions is that uh, is that this this delay lag like a thirty second lag. All right, um, and then two string very much like hash code, and I'll go to the parse method. The parse method takes a string as a parameter, and um, now we can see it throws parse exception. Now something I haven't really looked at before is the exceptions, and you'll see that. The two string method, for example, I say try catch runtime exception and error. And so um, if I get one of those, I'll just rethrow it. Otherwise, if I get throwable, then I'm going to throw an undeclared throwable exception. That's a runtime exception, an unchecked runtime exception. And in the parse method, the parse method declares that it throws parse exception. So there I catch runtime exception, parse exception, and error, and I rethrow those. But if it's a th any other throwable, I'm going to wrap that and, and throw it as an undeclared throwable exception. So this is something we have to consider. And if you go back just to um, a few slides uh, back to this code over here, there was actually a bug in this code. And uh, I didn't realize that there was a bug until quite late into the book. <laughs> I was like, Wait a moment! <laughs> this doesn't. This actually is not necessarily going to work. And the reason is, the invoke method, this invocation and invoke, declares that it throws throwables. You can throw anything. But then, inside there, I'm saying return method dot invoke object comma arc. So I'm calling via reflection the invoke method on the method object. But that can cause an invocation target exception if an exception occurs. All right? And so if that happens, let's say, for example, you get a null point exception during your equals. It shouldn't happen, but let's say it does. Then um, that's going to be wrapped with an invocation target exception. And then it's going to get wrapped again with an undeclared throwable exception that we see over here, this undeclared throwable exception. So it gets wrapped twice, all this exception being constructed. So but I'll show you a trick for how we get around that. If you have any questions, you're welcome to pop them into the chat and John will get them to me. All right. Um, now let's have a look at how we can make a virtual dynamic proxy because we've got the building blocks to build this thing. And um, here's my 
virtual proxy handler, which implements invocation handler comma serializable. And um, it's got a supply inside, just like our custom, uh, just like our virtual um, custom app, and a pointer to the actual subject as well. And then when I constructed a pass in the supplier, as you would expect, and I've got this private get subject method, which is very similar to what we had before. Um, if subject is equal to null, then subject equals supplier.get. Um, and then our invoke method returns method.invoke get subject, comma args. Right, so I, I do the same trick that I did before, where I'm simply delegating to the actual object by saying method.invoke. And, and you might be wondering, didn't Heinz just say that there's a problem with the exceptions? Because if an exception occurs, whilst calling the method, um, won't that be wrapped by invocation target exception and then wrapped again as an undeclared throwable exception? And if you thought that, then you would be thinking along the right tracks. So in my book, I, I've, I've got a bunch of, I've got a facade that has a whole bunch of useful methods inside. And uh, for example, I've got a virtual proxy method, which takes as a parameter and interface and the supplier and produces a virtual proxy. And one of the methods is cast proxy. You see, there, there are a bunch of issues here. The one issue is that when I make a dynamic proxy, what is returned from the new proxy instance method is a plain object. You see, the dynamic proxy can implement lots of interfaces. You wouldn't really know which one to use. It could be anyone, right? So they don't know who to cast to. Um, in, in most of the times, I, I only make dynamic proxies of a single interface. So um, I don't need to have the ability to support lots and lots of interfaces. Um, and so um, the cast proxy does a cast, first of all, to the correct type. <clears throat> so um, if I have custom map virtual proxy, it'll give, come back with a custom map, for example. Um, and then the other thing it does is it makes dynamic proxies faster. Uh, how does that work? I'll explain it a bit. I'll, when we get to the performance chapter, I'll explain why it becomes faster. But it makes them faster with the trick. And the other thing I do is um, if, if an invocation target exception occurs, then I unwrap that and I throw the content of that rather than, than the invocation target exception itself. So um, so this, this gives you the ability to get the correct exception back. Right, so, uh, yeah, it's, right. I un, no, I unwrap the invocation target exception and I, I throw the content of the, of the invocation target exception so, so that it won't get wrapped. Otherwise, the invocation target exception would get wrapped by the, inv by the undeclared throwable exception. It's like, you know, <laughs> wrapping, 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 wrapping until eventually you get the final answer. All right. Um, okay, so we can create a virtual proxy of anything we want, right? Even your tax return, okay? <laughs> Might not help much, but because you still have to do it at some point. But you could do a data source, anything where you've got an interface, you can make a virtual proxy of. And here what I've done is I've made a, I just said proxy.virtualproxy, passing a custom map and a custom hash map. And again, it works exactly like before. Now that's the good news so far. There are some restrictions. Uh, the first restriction is that this only works for interfaces, right? And there's a reason because dynamic proxies all extend the Java Lang Reflect proxy class. Now that might've been a mistake, but it is what it is. If you uh, if you want the, if you want something different, you need to use something like CGLib, ByteBuddy, or do it more manually. Since Java 15, we've got a, a mechanism called hidden classes. That's new JEP that's uh, that's just uh, been been implemented. So that's something new that that you might want to use instead of this. But this is really convenient because it's super easy to make a dynamic proxy. The other ones need a bit more bit more work. Um, <clears throat> The other one is about the undeclared throwable exception. As I said, if you have um, uh, an exception that you don't expect, like from a runnable, I'm throwing an IO exception, which of course is not allowed. 
then it gets wrapped as an undeclared throwable exception, and then that's then that's thrown. Um, so we should we only need to we should only throw declared exceptions, methods exceptions declared by the interface method, or error and runtime exception also will always work. All right. We have to make sure that the runtime return types are correct. So if you've got an interface foobar with void foo, you can return anything because the return type is not used. If you've got a Boolean, it needs to be Boolean. If you pass in, for example, an int like 42, you get to get a class cast exception. And um, int bas return null, well, that's going to give you a null point exception, as you probably expect. So it's a bit, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a pain. It's it's a pity that they don't have the ability to have um, the actual values coming back like you like you do with with method handles. But it is what it is. The the Java Lang reflect method predates um, method handles by quite a few years, so <laughs> we didn't have that option. All right. Um, when I was writing the book, I um, I felt really nervous about it because. Um, one of the problems I, I have is, uh, is I, right, it, when I go to conferences, I, I, I'm, I'm walking around and I, I want to talk to people because I'm at the conference to meet people. And I'll walk up to somebody and I'll say, um, hi, um, I'm Heinz. And, you know, in the days we could sort of shake hands. Though, remember those days? And, we, and I'd, off my hand I'd say, hi, I'm Heinz, Heinz Carbots. And they'd go like, uh, yes, I, we know who you are. I'm going like, Okay, great. Um, that's nice. Um, but in my mind, I'm thinking, but I don't, I don't know who they are. I mean, I would love to meet some people. Um, and it's, it's really, it's really a problem um, when you, when you're too recognised in a, in a, in a, in a, like a conference because you don't get to speak to anybody except maybe some other speakers who, who you know as well, right? <laughs> but if it's um, someone Fritz Meyer, I don't know, I don't, don't know who that is. I don't know the name, and you know, want to get to know some people and talk to them and. Uh, and uh, you can't because you start talking and they're like, we know who you are. And they're all scared and run away. And you're like, okay, <laughs> it didn't work too well. <laughs> so um, so when I was writing my book, I, I sort of had a, had a real fear because I thought if I publish something terrible, people are going to read that and go, this is, this is really bad. <laughs> this is a really bad book. It's a really bad book. Uh, uh, why is this guy so famous <laughs> in the Java world, right? I mean, I'm not famous anywhere else, but, uh, but, but, and I thought I could really ruin my reputation by publishing a bad book. And that's one reason why I took so many years to actually write something. And, um, and so I was, I was very nervous about that. And, and at some point I thought, well, maybe I should use my disadvantage or my, my, my feeling of, of not being able to do this to my advantage. And so I sent an email to like thousands of people. I said, hey, would you like to help review my book? <laughs> we got like this horde of 500 reviewers jumping on me and saying, yeah, we'll join you. You know, great. So this was really fun. And um, of those 500, about 100 actually gave me some useful feedback. Um, so normally a book has like three or four reviewers. We had <laughs> 500 reviewers, right? <laughs> and... Um, it, some of them were absolutely unbelievably amazing, um, and I remember the one of them, jo, Joseph Ottinger. He he's he used to do reviews for um, the server side Java Symposium, I think it was, and and some other other uh, publications as well. And he he was he was just, he was brutal. I mean, when I read his comments, I actually. Um, I wanted to quit for a while. <laughs> this is just awful. <laughs> I don't know if a book was that bad because I thought it was actually quite good. But one of the things I said is I said, well, you know, the these are slower. Dynamic proxies are slower than calling it directly. And he just dug in and he said, no, you need to say exactly why they're slower. You mean exactly why. Why are they slow? Why should they be slower? And at the time I said, I don't know. I mean, I just, they're just slower, right? Um, you know, it's dynamic code. It's going to be slower. He said, but why? But why? And I was like, okay. So then I went and did a proper JMH benchmark. Um, you know, JMH, you know, we all know what that is. And um, the, the, the challenge with that was that, um, well, first of all, it took a long time 
took really a lot of effort to 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 test and to write the code with JMH and to test it and test it and test to make sure that everything was correct. Um, and there were a few things which we noticed. For example, return types and parameter types, uh, parameters might be boxed. So that, of course, converted from int to, to integer objects. And that, of course, will slow us down. Um, parameters get wrapped with object arrays and they can be eliminated sometimes, but not always. Um, and then the third one was that methods have this amnesia and they check our permission on every call. And uh, so basically every time you make a method call with reflection, it says, uh, excuse me, who are you? I'm going like, uh, I'm Heinz. And they go, uh, check, check, check. And they say, ah, yes, you've got permission to call this method. And then you can call the method. And then the next time you go again, say, hello, I'd like to call the method. And go like, uh, who are you? Going, I'm Heinz. Oh, okay, check, check, check. Oh, yes, you can call the method. And this slows us down. Um, and so the trick that I used was, um, I, via reflection, I went and and found all the method objects inside all the dynamic proxies, well, the ones that you registered with that, where you said cast proxy, and then I set them to be accessible true. Now, the methods are public anyway, because, well, it's an interface, so interface, so the, the dynamic proxies are only, only going to be uh, implementing methods which are uh, public methods, it won't implement the private methods of interfaces. Um, but they're all are public anyway. So making these methods public, set accessible true, doesn't really harm us that much. Um, and um, what I did was I would, I would basically, if, if for some reason it wouldn't allow me to do that, I would simply just silently ignore that and, and just, just move on. Um, and, and this making accessible true makes makes quite a big difference. I'll show you the performance in a bit. So I spent a lot of time um, writing this performance code, and 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 then afterwards uh, Joseph gave me the thumbs up. Said this is now it's good. Now I can actually, you know, not just do hand waving and say, well, it's slow because it's done to make code, but you can actually see why it's slower, rather than just explaining you know, it. It must be slow because it's dynamic. That's no good excuse. So I've got a worker. The work has an increment method with a long counter, which simply gets incremented, and consumes CPU, which consumes just a tiny bit of work. You see, the overhead is, is actually quite low with these things. And if you give it any more work to do, you won't really be able to tell <laughs> the difference between the various approaches. And then um, I have five different types of method calls. The first one is a direct call, where I'm calling it directly on the actual real worker, right, calling the methods on that. And I'm calling the increment here. Then I've got the static proxy. We've got a handwritten proxy. I've got a dynamic proxy direct call. And the dynamic proxy direct call, what that means is I've, I've, I'm, I've got a dynamic proxy, but I've basically got one dynamic proxy per method, or rather one invocation handler per method. In other words, it's not correct. <laughs> it doesn't matter uh, what method you call on the object, I'm always going to call increment, for example, or I'm always going to call consume CPU. So the dynamic proxy direct call is not a correct implementation. It's just for comparison to compare um, where, where the performance gets lost. And, um, and then I've got the dynamic proxy reflective call that's using normal reflection. And turbo means that, that I've got the that I've gone and set set accessible true on the methods. We call this method turbo boosting. Um, and then with our turbo boosting, you see it, that's that's another another time on here. Now on the rightmost column, you'll see bytes to operation, EA escape analysis on and off. So um, bytes on uh, so you can see that direct call and static proxy don't, don't make any objects because it's just a, just a long. There's no object allocation at all. But the direct a dynamic proxy direct call, um, since driver 14 would would also not have any object allocation if you've got the scape analysis on. Now the times are with the scape analysis on. Um, now the, the 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 figure that's really interesting is the one dynamic proxy reflective call. So that's your 
with turbo on. So you see 9.7 nanoseconds, um, and it allocates 24 bytes. Doesn't matter if the scap analysis is on or off, it always allocates 24 bytes. So when we do a comparison, we need to compare the 3.5 nanoseconds for the static proxy with the 9.7 nanoseconds of the reflective core. And it is a big difference, but don't forget that the what well, the actual operation is, is is nothing. It's like long plus plus. It's it's really, really little. All right. The consumed CPU, here that's a lot closer because you don't have object allocation. So there's no object allocated. And um, you can see that the diary core is 4.8, static proxy 5.5, and then I'll skip down to the dynamic proxy reflective core turbo is 7.6. So you need to compare the 7.6 with the 5.5. So it's about, that's 2.1 nanoseconds slower. So it's, it's really, really close with, with this one. And we can see that the, the total overhead is 6.2 for the increment, uh, but part of that cost is the object allocation. And then 2.1 for the consumed CPU, it's very, very little. And um, in a typical business application, that's hardly going to be no noticeable. You know, if, if you're doing an a online, you know, like a, a high frequency trading, you're not going to do it like this anyway. So <laughs> it's not going to be a problem. Um, one of the things I've always said is that um, a lot of the patterns are closely related, and I call them the design patterns cousins. Um, and the the proxies, the structure of the proxy is very similar to that of the decorator or filter, and object adapter and composite. So what I did in the book was I I went and implemented. Uh, different mechanisms for, for each of these patterns as well, because um, it can be very useful to do that. And for example, remember we did this custom map at the beginning of the, of the, of the talk, and we started with this interface, custom map, and then we had all this duplicated code, uh, copy and paste, you know, auto-generated. It's, it's really pain, painful to do this. Um, luckily, the IDE can help us, but when you see the IDE helping us too much, we realize that maybe we shouldn't, maybe we should find a different way to not have to do it with, with at all, you know. And um, and so a lot, lot, lot of um, lot of duplication here. So what we can do, I've written a dynamic decorator, and all you do is you say proxies.filter, and you pass in a custom map interface and the hash map. Now I'm using, I'm, le I'm leaving out lots of lots of information here. There's like a whole chapter on this in the book, because when I do that, when I pass in an interface and an unrelated class, you can't just match. You can't just do method invoke on the object. <laughs> that won't work because the get method on custom map is a different method to the get method on the hash map. So two different, completely different methods. So they're not compatible. So what I did was I wrote something called a V table, which is a fast match between different methods. And so when you call the custom map, it then finds the method with the same signature in the hash map and calls that instead. And um, it, it even manages, uh, uh, for example, um, default methods, which is quite difficult because the default method is automatically implemented in the dynamic proxy instance. But then um, what happens is when you, uh, when you call it, you're calling the, the dynamic proxy version, not the one in the interface. And um, yeah, in the book, I've got a way of how, how to do that, which, which is quite fast, um, but it's quite complicated. Um, and then another thing here, I'm, I'm making a virtual proxy of custom map in the second example which takes a, a, a filter that makes this custom hash map. And if I want it to be thread safe, then I simply make a synchronized proxy that points a custom map and virtual proxy and filter. Now at the moment, I, I, I haven't really made the cascading easier. You, one could um, probably do something to make it, so we don't have to repeat custom map.class over and over again, but for now I've just left it like that. Um, that's the end of my, my talk. Um, so the thing is, do we have any questions? 
Um, and don't forget to get the gift, the present, as geschenk, uh, tinyurl.com slash jugch911. And um, if you're not on my newsletter, you're welcome to subscribe. Um, say hello to Java Special, Heinz at Java Special at EU, and you can get the book if you want. So, 30 seconds of silence whilst I wait for any questions that might pop up. <laughs> we had some questions already. There's something I wanted to show you, but it wasn't a different talk. I took it out of this talk, um, and that was the naming of the the naming of the classes. Um, so, if your if your interface is package um, package access, so it's declared inside a package, it's, uh, but it's not public in other words. Then it's going to have the same package name. Your dynamic proxy will have the same package name as your interface. Um, that's the first restriction. The other, other thing is that if, if it's inside a module, it's going to be in, and it's not exported, it'll be some other funny name. Uh, in fact, I've got an example. I'll just run that and I'll show it to you. You'll see it. So, I can find that. It was under. Um, not that one, this one. So samples, chapter three, proxy name. No, not that one. Gotchas, proxy name. So this is the idea, is we've got um, an interface base component. The base component interface has got, um, is, is a public interface and it's exported from this module. And um, so that one is going to be um, in the comsun, I think comsun.proxy, something like that, naming. If you run that, you'll see the output. Do something like that. And uh, yeah, so it's com, com sun proxy dollar proxy zero. It doesn't have to be that. It can also be something else. But um, th that's what most of the time you'll see. Um, and then the com sun, the second one is a public interface, this one here, but it's not exported from the module. And then you get this sort of a dynamic, I think it's, I'm not sure what this this uh, module is called that that lives in, but it's it's a module that's, I think it's an unnamed module or something like that. But from outside of this module, you can't see that at all. It's really hidden away from you. And then the other one is, is a hidden class, which is package access, that's gonna kind have of the same package as as the interface. So it's EU Java Specialist Books Dynamic Proxy Sample CHO3 Gotchas. So there's a question I saw uh, from Patrick Reinhardt. Hi, Patrick. I was actually wondering if you were there. I thought, I'm sure Patrick's going to be there. Patrick is famous for adding transfer2 to, to Java. Thanks, Patrick. I love that method. Um, and many other things too, not just that. So is there a dynamic method variant for the vacation handler? Unfortunately not. Unfortunately, don't have that option. It would be nice to have that, also to have sort of the method handle supported directly in there, because that then you could make it as fast as, um, as as calling it directly. But it, no, we don't have that, unfortunately. Any other questions? <laughs> Sounds like weird silent times. No, there's a, a question that John sent me. Are we limited to just method proxy and args and vacation handler? Uh, yeah, so that, that's it's very specific. Like you can only have those those types in here or those those values in here. Um, let me quickly open my slides again. And it's basically that's it. Um, and and it's sort of what happens is that everything gets multiplexed. 
So you then have to inside inside your invocation and you've got to figure out what was actually called. So that's this over here. Uh, wait, the wrong, wrong slide. It is, where is this slide here? So inside your invocation invoke method, you need to then figure out what is what actually happened. What was the method was called? All right, so Friday evening. <laughs> Friday evening, no more questions. Yeah, it seems like everyone is already like having their fire up beer and then going. <laughs> so, so how is free during these days? It's wonderful, except except we have um, we've had lots of cases in Khania. So, well, lots, not not lots like, you know, like one or two per day, but that's a lot for us. And so they've, they've basically just shut down the whole city. Um, uh, now it's, it's stabilized again, but um, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, yesterday we spent the day on the morning on the beach and swimming here, just where I'm sitting here, I'm not, you know, and had lunch in Kalathas. So it was really nice, uh, fantastic. But um, the restaurants are really suffering. Everybody's suffering because... Crete, you know, you you probably heard about the Greek catastrophe catastrophe a few years ago, um, and at the time when the whole of Greece was just suffering like crazy, Crete was okay because we had lots of tourists. <laughs> so now, <laughs> now we're completely messed up. I mean, it's really bad, really bad, because I mean, without the tourists and the tourists that have come have made us sick, so um, it's become really a problem. Uh, yeah, and also to, you yeah. don't want to go from Switzerland there because you probably need to go to quarantine afterwards. So that's also not fun. No, no. It's, um, th that's the problem. It's just traveling around at the moment. It's, it's really horrible. But it's, it's always a, you, you know, Patrick, the funny thing was um, last year, um, last September, October, I decided I'm going to write a book. And I was actually, I was going to write a different book, not this book that I've written. And, um, and I said to myself, I'm going to dedicate this year to writing a book. Um, so I decided I'm not going to accept any conference invitations for 2020. <laughs> not one. <laughs> <laughs> and the only one where I was really tempted to go because my daughter wanted to go there because, um, well, she, she liked it the last time we went, was Voxed Milan. <laughs> so you wanted to actually, which was in April or March or something. <laughs> and like at the last minute, I said, no, you know, I know, I, I, I know she wants to go, but let's, let's not go this year. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I've obviously I've lost flight flights and stuff, you know, I mean, I've, I've lost money, obviously everyone's lost, everyone's lost money on this whole thing, but, but um, it could be a lot worse. <laughs> and I've, I've spoken a lot because, you know, I've spoken in Nigeria last Saturday, and then I've spoken in Kenya, and I've spoken in Bulgaria, and I've spoken in uh, 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 Serbia, I think it was. I've spoken lots of different places because, and places I've never been to uh, because of this. So, you know, there you go. There's always good and bad <laughs> yeah exactly and the nice thing is actually you can stay at home um yeah that's perfect actually no traveling and um horrible airports and so on yeah but uh, you know i i really do like getting some supplies of swiss chocolates and getting some you know getting some schweizer schweizer keys to take home and uh, I, I do like getting my supplies you know the, the one the, the one easter i went to switzerland and on the way back i got uh, you know, all these gold tars because it's right about Easter time and, you know, this big supply of gold tars. And this year, my kids said to me, you know, this is the first year that we can remember where we're not getting gold, tar gold tars for, for Easter. <laughs> I said, well, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't traveling at all. So no gold tars for Easter. For so Easter. May maybe we can work on the chocolate supply. Let's see. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. Thank it's you very much. for having you. And thanks also me. thanks to all the um, um, participants. Just make sure, and sorry, Heinz, I'm now switching to the slides again, to mine. Um, yeah, go for it. So you're actually transferring afterwards to the uh, feedback form. 
So please enter the, the data and you might win something. But also I want to say thank you like to Heinz actually making it here and also the, the people behind all this. So for example, Ursula with the administration and the registration and so on. And also Marcus, who was actually supporting us in the background, making sure that all the participants are doing well, getting connected and so on. So, and obviously also our sponsors, which you saw when you were in the waiting room, um, we also need to thank you them because they um, help us to run these events. So, um, Heinz, thanks a lot again. Yeah, thanks. And back to you, I think it should work now, yes. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it was a pleasure having you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, keep safe. Bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye.